Welcome to the Kotki Ride Home for Wednesday, September 1st, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, would you take a flying rideshare taxi? NASA is betting on it. Plus, murder hornets are back and badder than ever. And the growing genre of bedroom pop, which isn't what it maybe sounds like. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. NASA has officially started flight tests with the dark horse of air taxis Joby Aviation, marking the agency's first ever test with an electric vehicle takeoff and landing aircraft, or EVTOL. Now, if you haven't heard of Joby Aviation, don't worry, they've gone under the radar for a while, pretty much until earlier this year when they went public. You might have heard of Joby Tripods, though. They are the same people. Jobin Bevert, the founder of Joby Aviation, also invented the Gorillapod. But anyways, Joby Aviation has been quietly toiling away for over a decade, completing more than 1,000 test flights to meet the requirements outlined by the FAA and other global aviation regulators. They haven't officially been certified yet, but working with NASA's Advanced Air Mobility Campaign is a step towards that goal. And their aircraft, which is powered by six electric motors, is designed to accommodate one pilot and four riders, with the intention of being a rideshare service. As they say on their site, quote, Flying with us might feel more like getting into an SUV than boarding a plane. End quote. It's basically Uber, but for flying cars. Literally, actually, in 2020, Joby Aviation acquired Uber's EVTOL division, Uber Elevate. Joby also received early funding from the venture capital arms of Toyota, Intel, and JetBlue. Some of its impressive funders and partners, as well as its good relationship with the FAA and now NASA, and the company's experience having been around longer than most other competitors, is why CNET thinks that Joby could be the company that will become the first to market a commercial EVTOL. This latest announcement makes that even more likely. NASA's Advanced Air Mobility Campaign is designed to, quoting the campaign, promote public confidence and accelerate the realization of emerging aviation markets for passenger and cargo transportation in urban, suburban, rural, and regional environments, end quote. And during these flight tests, they'll be monitoring the Joby aircraft's movement and sound, as well as safety concerns. They'll also be working with the FAA to craft new rules for electric air taxis. So Joby is going to be a part of making the rules that they'll have to pass, giving them pretty good odds. Though The Verge notes that getting certified is a long process, and some think it could be up to five years or more before any EVTOL company gets FAA certification. Despite that, Joby still says they plan to launch their air taxi service in 2024. One of the big things NASA will be watching for is something that Joby seems to be quite good at, noise control. And despite having six propellers, their aircraft are remarkably quiet. On their YouTube channel, they have a video comparing the noise produced by six different aircraft, including their own, showing just how quiet it is compared to normal airplanes and helicopters. But as CNET pointed out, the real video to watch on their YouTube channel is one of founder Jobin Bevert. About a minute into the video of him talking about the company, the Joby aircraft behind him starts preparing to take off. He keeps talking as the propellers start going, and then the aircraft launches into the air and takes off right as he finishes his speech. It's a really well-timed shot, very effective, but the most remarkable thing CNET points out is that Bevert never even had to raise his voice while the aircraft took off. He doesn't even appear to be wearing a mic. If he'd done that in front of a helicopter, there is no way we would have heard him. The Joby aircraft isn't silent, but compared to a helicopter, it might as well be. And that's key to the success of an EVTOL company. If their goal is really to have a kind of rideshare service ferrying people across towns all day and night, they can't be as loud as most aircraft are now. They've got to be quieter or else they'll never get approval, officially or from the public. So Joby is definitely on the right track there, and impressively so. And also, just to clarify, like most EVTOLs in development, the Joby aircraft isn't designed to drive on the road. Pretty much only one EVTOL from Aero Mobile is designed to do that. So despite the fact that all of us writing headlines tend to refer to them as flying cars for shorthand, clarity, and clicks, they really aren't at all. They're just aircraft, no car to them at all. In a rant about this in 2017, The Verge compared it to when they and others, including myself, pushed back against calling those self-balancing scooters hoverboards. 
They didn't hover at all, and calling them that makes the actual technology they possess, which is admittedly kind of cool, sort of underwhelming. And if we ever got real hoverboards in the future, what would we call those? And continuing with the Back to the Future comparisons, in part two, when the DeLorean is modded to fly, it can still drive. Like all the other cars that we see in airspace traffic, it transitions between street driving and flying. Most of the EVTOLs right now don't. They just fly. So we should probably stop calling them flying cars. But like the hoverboards, what else do we call them? Self-balancing scooters was never a term that caught on, and there were too many brands making them to call them simply by the brand name. Likewise, there's no term yet that exactly gets across what these aircraft do that isn't a mouthful. People call them flying cars for the same reason people called them hoverboards. It's a concept we're familiar with, even if it's wrong. It's a succinct term people recognize that evokes futuristic technology. Is it frustrating? Yes. But it's incredibly difficult to get people accustomed to a new term when there's a more recognizable one right there. There are a lot of other companies around the world right now working on EVTOLs, but maybe if Joby continues to be the impressive leader of the pack and goes commercial long before anyone else, we'll just call EVTOLs Jobies. Kind of like we call tissues Kleenex, even when it's a different brand. I'm not saying it's a great solution, sounds a little funny right now, but at least it's kind of more accurate than flying car. So I just got back from Washington State, a trip that required a lot of logistical navigation. You know, there was COVID, of course, but also the wildfires in that part of the country. And as former guest host Glenn Fleischman reminded me as soon as I landed in Seattle, the murder hornets. Washington State was the first place that murder hornets were found in the U.S. in late 2019. But this past week, officials in Washington found and removed another nest, the first one of this year. Now, as I said on one of the very first episodes of this show, murder hornets, or Asian giant hornets, are nicknamed murder hornets because of the destruction that they wreak on other hornets as well as honeybees, the colonies of which they can destroy in mere hours. Despite their shocking size of almost two inches long, they don't pose the same threat to humans. Now, I feel like when people hear about murder hornets, they envision Hitchcockian swarms invading city streets as people immediately die from a single sting. It's not that intense. They are still dangerous to humans, though. Murder hornets don't bother with humans unless provoked, but when provoked, they'll sting. And while Scientific American points out that milligram for milligram, murder hornet's venom is less toxic than a honeybee's, the murder hornet is so big that it has a larger dose. And crucially, it can sting you over and over again. Quoting Scientific American, People stung by the hornet have described the experience as like being stabbed with a hot metal pin. The stinger is long enough to pierce the standard protective gear beekeepers wear. A recent article in the New York Times claims that up to 50 people in Japan die from Asian giant hornet stings each year. End quote. So it's important to root them out, and important for those doing so to be protected. And that note about the stinger being long enough to pierce usual beekeeper gear is why if you see any photos or videos of officials removing the nests, they wear thick, sci-fi looking suits. The Washington State Department of Agriculture found the most recent nest from a combination of tracking devices placed on hornets and a resident tip line. They say that this nest was three times bigger than the previous one and that the hornets were a little more aggressive. The nest was in a rotted alder tree where officials vacuumed up 113 worker hornets and netted 67 other hornets from the surrounding area. All told, the nest housed nearly 1,500 hornets in various stages of development. It's important to eradicate the nests because the hornets, not being native to this part of the world, can cause havoc on the ecosystems they invade, especially threatening our already dwindling honeybee population. So the odds are you probably won't die from a murder hornet sting, but their presence in North America is unfortunately still fairly concerning. Alright, so here's something that's been around for three to four years, but I'm only hearing of it today, and maybe you haven't heard of it either. It's a genre-ish of music called bedroom pop. 
In short, it's music that was made in people's bedrooms with whatever gear and resources they had available, or music from artists who at least got their start that way. It tends towards lo-fi vibes even when it becomes more produced. It spans genres, but there's a decent community feel among the artists, all of whom originally found an audience independently online. I really like how The New Yorker positions it in the introduction for their 2019 profile of musician Claro. Quote, At some point in the past decade, the bedroom replaced the garage as the primary spiritual escape hatch for suburban teenagers who wanted to express themselves through music. Oversized amps and hand-me-down drum sets were usurped by Wi-Fi, laptops, and home recording software. The angst and the noise of garage rock gave way to more subdued sounds as young musicians began making the kind of hushed, internet-facing electronic pop that could be kept secret from adults rather than weaponized against them. This insular form of music eventually crystallized into a scene called Bedroom Pop, a digitally connected cohort of musicians with its own stars, styles, and dedicated playlists. It also shifted the meaning of the word bedroom in music away from the sensual and toward the cerebral. Like many terms used to characterize microgenres, bedroom pop is a misnomer. Not all of it is recorded in bedrooms, and most of it is not popular, but it is an apt description of a woozy, lo-fi style generated from self-imposed isolation." End quote. Of course, The New Yorker could have never known in 2019 just how much more intensely young people would be feeling that bedroom isolation today, which is perhaps why, despite initial bristling at the label, more and more artists and listeners are embracing the bedroom pop title now. Quoting an NBC News piece on the genre from early 2020, The independence and individualism of bedroom pop has meant that its artists have the freedom to explore their more personal and intimate experiences. The result is music that is often infused with the identities of the artists, giving the genre strong representation from people of color and the LGBTQ community." Which is perhaps why I first heard of the genre today from the LGBTQ media outlet Them, announcing the release of a debut EP from X-Men actor Elliot Page and his friend Mark Rendell, which the duo describes as a lo-fi bedroom pop adventure. Now, a mainstream actor releasing an EP is not the same as a teenager secretly recording tracks in their parents' house, but neither of them were signed to a label before putting up their music online and getting thousands of hits. And in this way, bedroom pop reminds me of what happened in the early 2000s, but which never got its own genre name as far as I know. See, as much as we make fun of MySpace, it really was a turning point in the music industry, at least in terms of young people and DIY artists being able to get a foot in the door. Sure, you could upload music files to websites before MySpace, but you had to pay server fees and have some level of coding know-how. With MySpace, it was super easy for a young teenager or anyone else to record themselves singing or playing guitar into their family computer's microphone, upload it to MySpace, and then have people around the world find and listen to it. Hundreds, if not thousands, of artists who got their start on MySpace went on to sell albums, go on tour, eventually sign with labels, and become full-time musicians. One of my favorite bands to this day is one that I found while poking around on MySpace back in 2006. Shout out to Sherwood, forever my number one on Spotify Wrapped. Like so much of the internet when it's at its best, MySpace lowered the barrier of entry and made making music for an audience an accessible dream for way more people than it had been previously. The difference with bedroom pop today is that the technology to create music at home is way better, and you can sound almost as good as an in-studio recording, and that a lot of the people making it have grown up in a world where this was always possible, a world of internet and social media and garage band on their MacBooks, even if garage bands aren't so much a thing anymore, according to the New Yorker's assessment of bedroom pop. Bedroom Pop shares a lot of similarities with the DIY movement and other independent artists. Some may argue that certain Bedroom Pop artists could lack some of the values that define DIY, but Jamie O'Born, founder of the indie label Dirty Hit, told NBC News, quote, I don't really see much of a difference in ethos. Maybe the difference is more about the times that we live in and an evolution of the marketplace and an artist's reaction to that as opposed to a difference of values, end quote. And many bedroom pop artists who have signed with labels say their bedroom pop roots will always be a part of the music they make, and most do sign with smaller labels that let the artist retain a lot of control. And fans tend to still consider them bedroom pop artists as well because so much of it is about the authenticity of the music. 
Cassandra de Guzman, a fan of bedroom pop artist Maya, told NBC News, quote, I feel like these artists are telling a story within the lyrics and the music they create. It's as if the fans have a connection to these bedroom pop artists since their music is so relatable, especially since I'm a teenager growing up and discovering myself, end quote. And again, despite being a bit older and definitely more established in the entertainment industry than most bedroom pop artists, you can hear the same honesty and authenticity coming through at the start of Mark and Elliot's new track, Summer Summer, when they leave a flub in the final recording. It's a good song. Oh, sorry, started. <laughs> Bedroom pop seems like a natural fit for Paige, whose most famous musical performance is singing a cover of the Moldy Peaches' Anyone Else But You with Michael Sarah at the end of the movie Juno. The Moldy Peaches were an indie band in the 90s and early 2000s and big players in the anti-folk scene. Stripped down, yearning vocals, tinkling percussion, fanciful but raw lyrics, all very similar to a lot of what we hear in bedroom pop now. Now, I somehow missed this growing surge of bedroom pop, but I love what I've heard now, and I'm here for anything that promotes accessible creation and honest expression. Now, if you want to check out more bedroom pop musicians, check out the complex link in the show notes. Well, that's all I got today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kaki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.